Welcome, dear listeners, to the Carolina Haynes Podcast, brought to you by Recapping Productions in a Darker World. I'm your host, Dan Sellers. The Mordecai House, built in 1785, is the oldest residence in Raleigh that still stands on its original foundation. The house currently sits in the Mordecai Historic Park, but when it was originally built, the simple farmhouse was intended to be the centerpiece of Joel Lane's 5,000-acre plantation. Colonel Joel Lane is considered the father of Raleigh. He sold the county the 1,000-acre lot where the city would be founded. Henry Lane inherited the house from his father, Joel, in 1795. Henry, in turn, had two daughters, Margaret and Anne. In 1817, Margaret married Moses Mordecai. Mordecai was a lawyer and a politician. In fact, he came from a long line of prominent North Carolinians. As well as being lawyers and politicians themselves, his ancestors were also educators and activists. And his grandfather was among the first group of Jewish immigrants to settle in America. The two took over the house and had three children of their own. Just four years into their marriage, in 1821, Margaret died, and Moses married Anne, Margaret's sister. Moses and Anne had big plans for the old family home. He hired a well-known area architect to renovate and expand the house. William Nichols was the architect of the North Carolina State House, and also the Alabama and Mississippi State Houses. Nichols transformed the simple farmhouse into a Greek revival mansion and gave it the moniker of Mordecai House. Around this time, Moses also decided to change the pronunciation of his name. He changed it from Mordecai to Mordecai. Joel Lane and Moses Mordecai were both wealthy slave owners but the Civil War stripped Mordecai of both his slaves and his fortune. Later generations survived by slowly selling off the 5,000-acre property. The family managed to keep control of the house until 1967. A group of developers offered to purchase the property, but when the public learned that they planned to raise the house and turn it into a parking lot, concerned citizens pressured the city and the Raleigh Historic Commission purchased Mordecai House and entered it into the Historic Registry. To recoup their cost, the Historic Commission wanted to open the Mordecai House up for tours. The house, however, was in a serious state of disrepair. During the renovations, construction workers noticed several peculiar things happening on the property. Once the house was open to the public, there was no denying it. The Mordecai house was haunted. Many paranormal events began to be reported by the housekeepers and the public. But according to one caretaker, it's after all the tourists leave for the day that things get particularly interesting. Quote, I saw objects move. I heard footsteps upstairs, but I was alone. However, he adds, eh, you get used to it. End quote. The Mordecai house is believed to be haunted by at least two women. Some believe that Margaret Lane haunts the house and can be seen walking around wearing a long black skirt and a white blouse. And the ghost of Moses' granddaughter, Mary Willis Mordecai Turk, is also seen in the house. Mary lived from 1858 to 1937. She can sometimes be heard playing the piano, 
and she's occasionally seen as a full-body ghost in a gray 19th century dress, but usually witnesses only see a thin, gray mist hovering near the piano. High House in Cary, North Carolina, is only 15 miles from Mordecai House. The fate of High House is very different from that of Mordecai, but its story is no less interesting. In 1760, Tignall Jones bought a house for his son, Fanny. The house dominated the landscape. It was built on a hill at the highest part of the road and was the only two-story house in the general area. Soon it became known as The High House. By the time Fanny Jones moved away from North Carolina in 1822, the road itself was called High House Road. During the time that Fanny Jones occupied the house, High House was the party place of Cary. Fanning hosted horse races on the 1,200-acre property, drawing in sportsmen, gamblers, prostitutes, and an abundance of alcohol. Of course, such an establishment also attracted its share of violence. These horse races would often result in hard feelings, fist fights, and even gunshots. One story tells the tale of two men who were in love with the same girl. One day, while everyone was distracted watching a horse race, one of the men pulled the girl apart from the other spectators and strangled her to death before anyone noticed. And many believe that she is the ghost of High House. In the 1830s, Nathaniel Green Alford purchased the house and the land. Nathaniel's daughter, Perninen, and her husband, Robert Williams, took over the property on his passing. Now, this was all well before the Civil War, and a 1,200-acre property needed many slaves to keep it running. The slaves claimed the house was haunted by the spirit of a woman, but no one really believed them. In 1850, Perninen and Robert had a son they named William. Yep, William Williams. And there were two slave boys that were about William's age, and they often played together and did their chores together. One evening, when little Willie was 11 years old, he was out in the orchard gathering apples with the slave children. His parents were not at home. They were attending an evening church service. He turned and looked toward High House and saw a woman walking in the yard. From that distance, Willie couldn't make out who it was, but he assumed his parents had returned. He ran to the house with a few of the boys, but no one was there. An hour later, when his parents finally returned, an excited Willie told them the story. His father dismissed it and sent Willie to his room. Willie would see the ghost at least two more times before the Civil War. One summer evening, he was playing in the front yard with his slave friends when she appeared just a few feet away. She opened the front gate and walked through it toward the old horse race track. Willie ran inside to get his father, but when they got back outside, the other children said that they had just vanished. Now, Robert Williams was a stern man. He had already told Willie that there was no ghost, and he meant that there was no ghost. The next time Willie encountered the ghost, his mother was with him. Willie was in the workroom, again playing with his friends, while his mother quilted a comforter. Suddenly, they all heard a loud commotion in the room above them. Willie called for some of the adult slaves to investigate, and, of course, nothing was there. Robert Williams arrived back home later that evening, and they told him what had happened. Enough is enough, he declared. There is no ghost. He forbid them to mention the subject again. And then came the day when Robert Williams saw the ghost himself. 
It was cotton picking time, and Robert had just gotten in from a long day in the fields. He was tired and he was cranky, and he just wanted to rest for a while. Suddenly, a woman walked through the hall, popped her head in the door, and turned to go upstairs. Robert thought that it was his daughter, Roxana, trying to scare him and called her back into the room. When the woman ignored him and continued up the stairs, Robert got angry. He walked out to the base of the stairs and demanded that Roxana present herself that very moment. Roxana and their mother were in the kitchen. When they heard Robert yelling, they knew he was mad. They both came out of the kitchen to see what was going on. Of course, that left Robert bewildered. He searched the upstairs himself, but as you might imagine, no one was there. He still would not admit that there was a ghost in the house, but he started to believe that something was going on. Robert died in 1861. A few years later, Willie, or rather, William Williams, married a girl and moved to her hometown of Raleigh. Roxana also married and stayed in the high house with her mother. Toward the turn of the century, William's wife died and he moved back to High House with his four children. Over 30 years had passed, and William had put all thoughts of the ghost out of his head. But one day, his own daughter came running in saying she had saw a woman out in the front yard. A woman who vanished. This brought back all of William's childhood memories. Soon after this, he picked up the entire family and moved to Briscoe, North Carolina. Once again, High House sat vacant. Now, I told you at the beginning of this segment that the fate of High House was very different from that of Mordecai. After Mordecai House sat abandoned, it was finally saved by the city of Raleigh and restored. Such was not the destiny of High House. One night... In the early 1900s, Leander Williams, one of Willie's cousins who still lived in Cary, had an odd dream. He had spent a lot of time at the high house as a child, and something in the dream told him that there was a great treasure buried beneath the hearth of the old house. Leander woke dazed and confused. He told his mother about the dream and she paled. She had had the exact same dream. They immediately rushed to the abandoned house, only to find that someone had beaten them there. The hearth had very recently been torn apart, brick by brick. Leander's mother told her friends about the experience, and word of the treasure of High House quickly spread. By the mid-1900s, the house had been completely demolished by fortune hunters. If anyone ever found a treasure, they never admitted it. To learn more about these stories, check out Lynn L. Hall's North Carolina Ghost, They Are Among Us. There's also the article, The Ghost of High House, an Alfred American Family Action Publication. Check out CarrieCitizen.com, NorthCarolinaGhost.com, and CandidSlice.com. This episode was researched and written by Jeffrey Cochran. It was produced and hosted by me, Tan Sellers. You can find everything that Jeff's up to at his company at adarkerworld.com. And you can find everything that I'm up to at recounterproductions.com. Don't forget to check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash recavic. And if you haven't heard, Jeff Cochran and I are hard at work adapting the Carolina Haynes podcast into the Carolina Haynes book. And you can be a part of it check out our campaign at Indiegogo. 
And while I'm at it, I'd like to thank Josh Garner for his generous contribution. Without your help, this book wouldn't be possible. Thank you so much. We're on Instagram at Recap It Productions, and I'm on Twitter at Hank vs. The Undead. You can email me your thoughts at recapitproductions at gmail.com. If you listen to the show on iTunes, please give us a five-star rating and leave us a review. And don't forget to share it with your friends. We'll be back in two weeks with a new episode. Tune in then to hear more about the things that go bump in the night.